macronutrient mix do you aim for? Like protein and... Yeah. So right now it's, uh, I can tell you, you know, my exact data off the top of my head. I, ch I check it all the time uh, because it's a constant process of, you know, evaluating and, and recalibrating. Um, so my averages literally from my last blood test, November 1st through today, our uh, protein intake is 107 grams per day, or I should start with calorie intake, which is a little below 2,400. So 2,370 something. Um, protein intake, 107 grams per day. Fat intake is about 93 grams per day with about 25 grams. And someone don't kill me if my exact numbers are off. This is what's in my head, chronometer data. 25 grams monounsaturated fat, um, about six grams of omega-3 coming mostly from walnuts. Um, 17 grams a day, uh, of omega six, again, mostly from walnuts. I get some other nuts too, almonds, cashews, um, what other uh, avocados, um, probably missing some nuts in there, but, uh, peanuts. So, uh, okay. And then saturated fat, I'm shooting for, uh, I, I'm at about 25 grams per day of that. And I get, uh, about 10 grams per day from cheese, full fat cheese. Uh, I make like what I call calzone guts. So calzone is like a breaded thing where you stuff it with cheese and tomato or in some case cheese and greens. So I basically ditched the bread and uh, I guess the keto crowd will love it. I ditched the bread and uh, it's spinach, tomatoes, cheese, and just one gram of salt. And I mix it together. It's, it's like I'm eating pizza every day. It's delicious. But the cheese adds saturated fat, which for me is correlated with higher glucose. So I have to be very careful with that. So, and then, and then, but okay. So, all right. So then, uh, and then the rest of that is carbs. So, uh, and uh, this isn't, you know, most people hear carbs and they think, oh, cut your carbs, you'll have lower glucose. Yeah, that's true if you eat junk food and your junk food diet is based on cakes and cookies. But on a whole food based diet, I just don't see that in my own data. So those are my targets, but I should say those are my targets for the next blood test. Those are different from my previous blood test. And I was saying this is a constant, a constant, cal you know, evaluation and recalibration. So for the last blood test, my fat intake wasn't 95 grams per day, total fat as it is now. It was about 115 to 120 grams per day. And uh, my protein intake was about the same, but I've been as high for a dietary period that corresponds to a blood test of about 140 grams per day. So, you know, it's evaluate. So getting the data and then saying, all right, the net effect of my net correlative effect of protein on all of these big picture biomarkers has more going in the wrong direction than right in terms of, again, statistical significance, not just looking at how many are, you know, it has, I, I use the, the statistics to guide it. So my protein intake is actually down from my highest, but actually higher than my lowest. I've had protein intakes in the 70 to 80 gram range. Um, but the data suggests that somewhere around where I am now may be optimal. Similarly for total fat, I've got more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So I cut my fat intake by 20 grams or so for this blood test, including about a 10 gram cut in monounsaturated and a little bit more than a 10 gram cut in saturated. And then the goal is if, if, uh, if total fat intake is correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right, if I cut my fat intake, I should ameliorate that and I should improve my overall biomarker profile on the next test. And if that's not the case, I'll get closer to the optimal fat intake for me by this constant process of getting the data and then recalibrating. So just as a last note on recalibration, my blood glucose levels have been uh, in the 90s, um, whereas they were in the 80s uh, in 2015 up until about 2019. So I think it's something like 14 blood tests in a row. My blood, glu blood glucose levels have been in the 90s. Now, I measured my insulin levels, uh, which are very low. They were like 3.1. So if you do the assessment in terms of uh, the homeostasis model of insulin resistance, which is a measure of insulin resistance, it's basically multiplying glucose times insulin. I'm still very insulin sensitive compared to the average population, but that my glucose levels are, like I said, 13 or 14 blood tests. I don't remember exact, exactly remember the number, but it's many in a row. In being in the 90s, I don't like that. I mean, granted, most of my other biomarkers look youthful, but uh, I don't like that glucose is going the wrong direction. So, um, you know, so clearly I go to the correlations. All right total fat is correlated with higher glucose. So clearly that's one reason that I've cut my total fat, saturated fat too, mono and saturated fat too. So that's one reason why I've cut those for my next blood test, but I haven't cut them tremendously down because fat also seems to be positively impacted, uh, positively correlated with other biomarkers. So just to finish that story in terms of calibration, 
Another variable that's significantly correlated with my glucose levels is niacin. Now, again, my niacin intake is not deficient, which is the below 15 milligrams per day. My average niacin intake has been about 30 milligrams per day since I started tracking six years ago. So I'm at two times the RDA. I've had intakes as high as 45 milligrams per day. So, but as I mentioned, going up to 45 milligrams per day, maybe that's correlated with better glucose, but my liver enzymes are going in the wrong direction. So for this blood test, I've actually increased my niacin intake, again, getting more mushrooms, which is also a benefit because now I also get the ergothionine and spermidine, which I was, you know, wasn't getting as much of before. So I've increased my niacin intake for my last blood test, which was about 27 milligrams to 36, 37 milligrams per day with the hope that if niacin is going to impact my glucose by getting it closer to my average intake over the past six years, I should see glucose come down. Now, because I also cut my fat intake and I'm also in increasing my niacin intake, I won't know right now which one did it, right? But I can evaluate that with more blood tests by changing the fat and changing the niacin to really get at causation. So in terms of the constant recalibration, you know, so I get the blood test data and then I evaluate all the correlations with my diet and, and, you know, biomarkers versus other biomarkers that takes a little bit of time, you know, a day or so. So if I see that I want to add more niacin into my diet and I've already gone two or three days with a relatively lower niacin diet, you know, 27 milligrams instead of 37. Now to get me to my target goals for the next blood test, I've got to eat a bolus of mushrooms. So for for, for example, you know, to get my niacin levels up to where they are now, I had to eat, you know, like, I don't know, 700 grams of mushrooms three or four times a week for a few weeks uh, to get them where they are now. And then I can kind of taper it back to stay around that average. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a constant process of getting the data, making the interventions, having these target goals, getting the next blood test data, reevaluating the correlations and then continuously reevaluating for each blood test to get closer to the, you know, what may be the truth in terms of optimization. So one thing that seems a little bit counterintuitive is that you said uh, to me anyway, that uh, increased fat increases your glucose. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that normal? I mean, or is it specific to you? <laughs> it may be. Yeah. I mean, I, other people have commented on that and they find it preposterous. That that's what it is. But, but, uh, I mean, that's what the data is, uh, you know, and actually it isn't just saturated fat, you know, granted, maybe it's a coconut butter thing, or it's a sat it may be a saturated fat in dairy issue because I had the significant correlation, uh, for my yogurt intake with, uh, which was full fat at the time with higher glucose. And then when I, uh, shifted to lower fat to do that experiment, uh, after I think it's six or seven or some amount of blood tests, I don't have that correlation for my yogurt intake with glucose anymore. So it may be the saturated fat in, in dairy. So I was eating more cheese. You know, I could, I could eat, I could eat 12 ounces of cheese a day. I'm like a cheese -aholic. Uh, So, so I've cut that down to two, two ounces a day, but I may have to cut that which I'm not happy about if it's a saturated fat and dairy issue. Um, but also monounsaturated fats are, significantly correlated with higher glucose in my data. I can't explain why that may, why may, why that may be, why that may be the case, but you know, I follow the data. Um, but you know, along those lines too, I think there's, there's another concept that I find fascinating, which is mismatch. And what I mean by that is so evolutionarily, you know, we evolved eating a certain way, but if you follow the way we e evolved to eat based on hope, all right, this is how prehistoric people ate, this is how I think is the best way to eat without actually looking at your blood test data. I think that's a suboptimal approach. So uh, and along these lines too, of, you know, mismatch, for example, we evolved, um, you know, with physical activity every day. If you were, if you were sedentary, you didn't eat, it was impossible. So for people that are sedentary now, there's a mismatch, right. Between how we evolved and right. And also sleep. We didn't evolve to stay up until 11, 12 o'clock. You know, when the sun went down, we we're pretty close to sleep, right? So that's a mismatch too, right? How much, how many days do you have to go where you're staying up later than after the sun has set? And now you're starting to mess with your circadian rhythms. And is it easy to get those back? I don't know. So that same idea of mismatch, I think applies to diet. And, you know, I can't, you know, superficially, I can assume, all right, a higher fat diet, lower carb diet, higher protein. I can just assume these things, but at the end of the day, I have to follow the, the net effect on these blood biomarkers. And, even though in theory, higher fat, you've got less, you know, lower amounts of carbohydrates that you're eating should lead to a better 
you know, uh, glucose levels. For me, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least not yet. And um, now that said, I'm not eating 30 grams of fat per day. And actually, when in terms of this idea of diet mismatch, I grew up on this idea of eat a very low fat diet. This is what's quote unquote optimal for health. This was the idea when I was in my teens. So for 30 years or so, I was eating this very low fat diet or not 30 years, but at least for my teenage years, maybe for 20 years. And I didn't have any blood test data. I did it based on hope and based on what, you know, quote unquote experts in the nutrition field were saying. But the fact is for me, eating very low fat diets, 10% of my calories lead to not good overall biochemical profiles. I mean, my HDL gets to levels as low as 28, which is preposterous. I mean, uh, and especially in my own data, I didn't have that data at the time, but I have a lot of, I have something like 17 blood tests between my HDL and C-reactive protein. For me, the factor that's most significantly correlated with inflammation at least C-reactive protein is HDL. So the higher my HDL, the lower my C-reactive protein. So I can only imagine, and I, did, I didn't have that data at the time. I didn't measure C-reactive protein when I got my HDL of 28, but I wonder what, what it would have been if that correlation is a real you know, uh, correlation. So um, eating a very low fat diet, again, 10% of calories are from, uh, from fat, very low HDLs, um, and actually very high triglycerides. So, um, now that said, I'm not eating 200 grams of fat per day. I haven't shifted to the other extreme. I'm at, you know, 90 grams of fat, which is still, uh, you know, 35% or so of my calories from, uh, are from fat. So, you know, it goes back to that. What is optimal at the end of one level is it 60% fat. Is it 15% fat? You know, if, if someone shows me data on 0% fat, if the, all their biomarkers look good, that's what works for them. If someone shows me data on 80% fat, that's it, it, but biomarker data, not just again, the lipid profile and glucose, show me kidney function and immunity and inflammation and all these other things. Um, overall biological age score, right? Um, these are all important metrics to track to, you know, to try to get towards what's optimal at the end of one level.